Hello, and welcome to the Must Talk podcast. This is Connor O'Boyle. Today I'll be speaking with film composer Christopher Young. Christopher has been working in Hollywood for over 30 years and has scored over 100 films. Some major blockbuster titles include Spider-Man 3, Drag Me to Hell, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, and Rounders to name a few. I caught up with Christopher at his studio last month during my time in LA and we discussed many things including his attitude to composition, meeting and establishing relationships with directors and how he's seen the industry change over his career. Unfortunately we had a few technical problems along the way so the audio was less than perfect but uh, I think you'll still find the episode very enjoyable. So without further ado I give you Christopher Young. Okay, so I'm with Christopher Young at his studio in Los Angeles, and we are going to have a conversation about everything that he loves, all things music, including his compositional processes and how he works with directors. So, Christopher, how are you? How are you doing? Very well, thank you, my friend. And Connor, it's great to be here with you. You and I go back a bit. We met in the Dublin, the film scoring program. Uh, Actually, no, we met in Bulgaria, in Varna, it's been about a year, right? Has it been a year? Holy shebang. But yeah. what talent you have. It's, you know, he's this, this guy is a, a super talented composer who's, who's uh, uh, just waiting to uh, be allowed the opportunity to uh, take over Cal- uh, Calif- uh, Hollywood, I should say. Okay. So uh, can you give us a little introduction to who you are and where you come from, what your background is like? Wait a second. Who am I really? I don't know. No, no. I am, uh, I am guess at the end of the, when push comes to shove, I am uh, probably best known as a film composer. And that's why I'm here. Most of a father, but, uh, and to my kids, I'm dad, which is thank the Lord. But to everyone but my kids, I guess I'm I'm primarily a film composer. Uh, and how did that happen? That happened not because, as it is the case with a lot of people who get involved in in movies in one in one man, one way, shape, or form. I didn't fall in love with movies when I was a kid. I, I wasn't addicted to going to the theater to see films. I liked them, but I was too busy living life and having fun out and about in the world of, uh, of the shores of New Jersey, having a grand time uh, being a musician, albeit I, you know just a, a little young kid sitting behind a drum set wanting to be Ringo Starr. But... Uh, but n- no, not so much in the theater. It wasn't until later that I fell in love with film music by chance, having discovered, uh, again by chance, a record in the local music store called The Fantasy Film World of Bernard Herman, And that had suites of his scores from uh, of various fantasy films. And by dropping the needle on that record, I knew instantaneously there was something here in this music that I had started to dabble with. I had had been trying to arrive at in my own attempts at writing, and that paved the way. The the Herman record, was it the artwork, or did you know who Herman was? I had no idea who Bernard Herman was. I had seen the films, but I I couldn't remember the films. The films that were that were featured on that record against the, he pre- prepared sweets from those films. They were, uh, started off with journey center of the earth and was followed by, uh, the seventh voice of Sinbad. You flip the record and then, then it was, uh, the day the earth stood still. And then finally Fahrenheit 451, four sweets. No, I bought it cause a pretty cool looking cover. Right. So it was the album artwork. Yeah. The album cover had and like, and I, you know, I love science fiction. Most kids, in America, you know, went through, most males, you know, at the age of 16, 17, went through, you know, that sci-fi period where we were into reading Arthur Clarke, A. E. Von Vogt. Asimov. Asimov and uh, Ray Bradbury, among the others, you know. Right, so you are from uh, the West Coast, right? Oh, no, I'm from the East Coast. Right, 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 the East Coast, yeah. East East Coast, I'm from New Jersey, uh, on the shores of New Jersey. Oh, okay. So when did you come out from the East Coast to the West Coast then, to to L.A.? Yes, I came out uh, from the East to the West uh, in 1980s when I moved to Los Angeles, 
uh, as a student, I had been accepted at long last after being rejected once into the graduate composition program. My first go around, I, su I submitted some music and my transcript from the college I'd gone to, Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, which was a super liberal arts college, and they basically laughed and said, you, you, you're joking, right? No, you're not ready to come in as a graduate composer into this program. So I went to, to a school in Texas called North Texas State University. That's what it was called at the time. I think it's changed. I was just simply North Texas University or something, Texas State. I don't know what it's called now, but it was a great, had a great music department in which the classical and the jazz department sort of coexisted together. I adored my time there because I got to lock myself away and really immerse myself in in instrumental music, orchestral music. I fell in love with the contemporary stuff and, and, and developed an, an insatiable need to, to, to research as best I can all things that were happening in co the concert music scene from about, you know, the, right after the World War II up until what was going on at that time. And interestingly, you know, uh, that all came to serve me well when I started working in, you know, horror, science fiction, fantasy films. Okay, so when you graduated from North Texas, did you uh, continue studying or did you move out to Los Angeles immediately and start looking looking for work? Yeah. No, I didn't graduate from North Texas. I went there for a year so that I could get together my, my credentials, my academic, uh, what do you call it? Portfolio. Port thank you, portfolio, so that I could reapply to UCLA and get accepted, which they did. They did accept me, so I came out as a student Student, continuing my graduate studies as a composer. And this is where you studied under David Raskin? I stayed, uh, studied under David Raxon. Oh, uh, David Raxon, yeah. That's yeah. okay. Everyone in my class, a lot of people on, in the class would call him Raskin, and he would go, that's not, it's not Raskin, it's Raxon. Yeah, David Raxon, who wrote the music to Laura, Forever Amber, and the, and the uh, Bad and the Beautiful, among other uh, um, wonderful scores. Uh, I I studied with and boy that was that was like I mean I can't quite ex describe it because the opportunity to have interaction with the guys who sort of set the stage for what movie music was all about he was a holdover yes a lot of his contemporaries were still around but they weren't teaching and they weren't that active Mikolas Rosha was around uh, Bronislaw Caper was alive when I moved out here. Johnny Green, uh, Lionel, I mean, Alfred Newman was deceased. Uh, Herman was deceased. Corn uh, Gold was deceased. Steiner was deceased. deceased. Tiomkin wasn't around. What's that? Alex North was still around, though, Alex right? Alex North was here, and I went to a class that he hosted at, at UCLA in the Extension Department, and that was just, that was a stunning experience. Yeah, so it was to have David Raxon, to be able to sit in the same room with the, the guy that wrote all these wonderful scores, it was nerve-wracking for me. I was, I was stunned. I mean, I was speechless. I was a nervous wreck around him because it was just remarkable. And would David Raxon or uh, Alex North or anyone have been like, um, you know, like Messian or people like that who were also teachers and used their own compositional um you know, their own compositions to teach their students? Actually, what he did was, uh, it's a year-long program, and it was the only class they taught in the fully accredited music composition program on the subject of film music. Remember when I moved out in 1980, film music was still considered dirty, dirty music. It was illegitimate. It was like the idiot bastard son of classical music and popular music was not meant to be taken seriously. So uh, what did he use as examples? In the fall semester, we, we watched full features scored by him and his friends. So I, I remember we watched Laura, of course. We watched Vertigo. I think we watched Vertigo. We probably watched King Kong with him, Max Steiner. Uh, 
you know, I can't remember all the films we, we watched, actually. But the first semester, or first part of the first semester, we watched big, we watched entire films. Then we started to watch scenes. And I'm like, just, just his movies, but his friend, and uh, oh, we must have watched Psycho. Oh, no, we watched Vertigo. We would watch films that were scored not only by him, but his buddies. Well, that's very interesting. Um, you know, being a student of yours, your teaching style is very similar to, to what you're describing here, obviously. You know, you use Vertigo as an example also. Yeah, yeah. I still use, I use the main title of Vertigo as a perfect example of what I call the, uh, it, it sets the course of, uh, in a very short time, uh, this insatiable world, uh, this in, indescribably complex world of mystery. And uh, it lures you, it, it seduces you into wanting to take a journey into this movie, even though we sense to the music it's dark and evil and maybe something we'd want to stay away from. He so successfully, you know, surrounds us, he envelops us with this, like I said, this overwhelming sense of mystery and, 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 uh, and of the unknown. And so, yeah, it's very engaging, yes. Same same thing I do with, in what I'm teaching is yeah. use some examples of other composers. Okay, so for let's uh, let's talk about composers that have influenced your music, okay. both both film or 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 concert composers. Right. So who would be you know your kind of main, um, kind of your main inspiration like the, the composer that you would return to time and time again you mean in the in the well there's the there's the con concert music there's film music there's pop music and there's jazz music those are probably the three four strains of music which have have fought that have influenced me when i was a kid of course i didn't even know classical music existed i heard what was on the radio i remember there was talk about these guys named Bach, Brahms, and Beethoven. And we heard it in one of my classes, but, you know, that was music way back then. And I didn't know there was people who were still writing for the orchestra and doing serious music. So, for me, it was pop music. All that, that's what I heard on the AM radio, the Beatles, the three Bs, the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and the Birds, and anything connected to them, and all the, the, the pop stuff from the 60s, the British Invasion. So that's my understanding of music. And then I moved to later on into, I got into the prog rock thing. And I think I said farewell to not only prog rock, but rock in general, I lost interest in around the time that the band called Gentle Giant disbanded. I really loved their stuff. And then I, of course, discovered film music and got interested in all things orchestral. And that's when I became obsessed with orchestra music. So at that moment, now I'm starting to research both film music and concert music. In the world of film music, it was Bernard Herrmann who opened up the, the door to me to this wonderful world. I'm not alone in that. There's so many other composers who who claim that Herrmann was the kickoff. But I became upset. Of course, there was the uh, David Raxon connection. I studied with him, and I knew all about him when I, well, as much as I could, about his music and him when I moved to Los Angeles. Uh, Laura, the Bad and the Beautiful, Forever Amber, three scores which are perfect in every way. But Jerry Goldsmith, I'd have to say, was the strongest influence on the way I thought when I started writing. Not only do I adore his music, but as it turned out, a lot of the films that I worked on, I was actually told, oh, yeah, no, we would have loved to have hired Jerry, but of course we don't have the money. Can you give us something like that? Yeah, and I go, yeah, I can do that, sure. So they're definitely, this, I'm, I'd be lying. The influence was there, and then it was really hard. And then Herman, and it's been always hard for me to sort of try my best to flush those composers out of my system. Right. I kind of went cold turkey on both of them, which meant that at a certain point when I started to realize this could be an issue, I didn't want to be a second-rate Jerry Goldsmith or Bernard Herrmann. I stopped myself from listening to the stuff. I, like, I didn't burn, I didn't collect the records and burn them or anything like that, but I just said, I'm not going to listen to this anymore. Okay. Okay. 
that helped distance me. So that's the that's the film music world. There's a lot of other composers I can mention. Elmer Bernstein was a great influence. Uh, Leonard Rosenman, a tremendous influence. Uh, Alex North, you know, uh, Bronislaw Caper, Dimitri Tiam, Miklos Rosha. I mean, the list, there's all, and Max Steiner, oh, Joe, Eric Wolfgang Korngold for their incredible sense of melody-driven music. I adore Korngold's music. I adore Max Steiner's music because at, at, at the heart of everything that they did was this keen sense, this insatiable uh, need on their part to entice their audience with a memorable melody, and that governs all their music. Uh, so, yes, so many of the influences from that school. Um, then I go to the concert music. Well, as it so happened, you know, I remember having a religious experience of sorts when I heard my first Penderecki piece, which was Eutrengia, The Entombment of Christ. Also, the same thing happened when I heard Ligeti's uh, Atmospheres, Requiem, Lux Eterna, the ones that were used in 2001. This opened up the door to me understanding music in a way that actually blew my mind. And so... I became obsessed with that, you know, the Polish school, the hung, you know, that Hungarian thing, uh, the Greek thing with Zanakis, all of that kind of music sort of got me going, and so I, I genuinely had a love, you know, have a love affair with it. And an interesting, when I started working in horror movies, that language was something that I that became valuable. I think you were most certainly a pioneer in bringing those extended techniques and that extended orchestration into into film music for sure i can't really think of a score that employed those techniques before maybe hellraiser no, i can't i wish i could say that was the case mm, i'm not really sure of any oh i can tell you two off the top of my head again an inspiration for me my favorite john williams score is close encounters and that does use you know this penderecki style writing and that so that was around. But it's, it definitely wasn't as, as ubiquitous as it is today. You know, like these sort of like, you know, if, have you heard like the, Dun the Dunkirk score that was oh, most, re it's most, it's, there's a lot of heavy glissandi use there, oh, okay. you know, and like that was never used prior to, you know, those sort of seminal scores yeah, from the, okay. from the eighties, you know, but, um, yeah, so Pender, what about kind of in the in the kind of common practice period? Would you have listened to um, kind of romantic music, or you know, kind of like the those periods, or was it all twentieth yeah, yeah. century nah, music? No, nah, no, nah, nah, of course not. Nah. Like everyone else, I think the very first piece of orchestra music that I heard that really I really connected with was probably Rhapsody in Blue. You know, the the George Gershwin piece. Uh, you know. Uh, Appalachian Spring by Aaron Copeland or uh, the uh, Grand Canyon Suite by Faraday Grofe. Plus, then you go, you know, starting moving backwards. Those were American composers, but starting to move backwards into the European scene, of course, you know, uh, Holtz, the planets, of course, they like everyone, you know, that knock my socks off. You know, the standard stuff, when you're starting, you, you end up going towards the same kinds of pieces that everybody seems to go, you know, the Nutcracker by Tchaikovsky, you know, or or the, um, uh, what's his name, uh, the Prokofiev, uh, Peter and the Wolf, you know, all the standard stuff. And so, yes, I can totally connected with the Romantics, you know. Less, I never was a big, I'm embarrassed to say this, but of course, I so it thoroughly admire Mozart. I think I've gotten, I've I've gotten sick of him because he's absolutely everywhere. You turn on the radio, the classical radio station in the morning, and I'm in fucking Los Angeles, and what are you hearing, Mozart? You know, come on, give me a break. You know, do we need to hear yet more Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn? Haydn, I, I'm, I'm I kind of have a soft spot for. But I just enough of that, please. So the classical period sort of has it in mind. I love Renaissance music. I love the colors, those instruments. Drives me crazy. 
classical period, Baroque period, kind of cool on. Then it starts heating up for me in the Romantic period, and the 20th century stuff drives me crazy. Right. What about like the minimalists? Would you have Would you have been interested in, in oh, the American yeah. minimalists? Definitely. You know, the first minimalist I heard was uh, probably uh, Morton Feldman. I mean, would you call him a minimalist? I don't know if he's considered a minimalist. He was then part of that New York scene with John Cage and Earl Brown and and uh, Christian Wolf. So yeah, that stuff I was very much into. Like I think so many people, my take on on John, uh, John Cage at first was a little hesitant. I didn't quite get it. You know what is this? Well, who is he trying to? He's trying to push this as push this off as me. So I went to the same stupid stuff that most teenagers are you know, composers in their tw early 20s go, and then I finally saw the light mm -hmm. when I realized the absolute significance of what he was doing. So I adored all that. I adored the stuff, you know, that was happening in the 60s to 70s and, you know, into the 80s. And of course, that's all passe now, you know. That's not happening anymore. Everything that was attempted by those composers seems to have been set aside and put into this... Uh, in, 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 you know, sort of like stuffed into the basement, uh, right. you know, in a freak or a sideshow freak show or something, right. you know, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No one really embraces that cluster stuff anymore. I think, I think it lives in, in universities now, you know, it, it definitely survives through, through academia rather than, yeah, sure. you know, occasionally you might hear it, it kind of emerging in, in, a, in a film score occasionally, you know, I think like Scorsese's Shutter Island uses, yeah, yeah, sure. uses some cage and stuff, yeah, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, but it's more for uh, for like like a sting, you know. Like it would be like uh, for people who don't know what a sting is. It, it's kind of like a like a shock technique within within movies to scare the audience. Yeah, yeah, right. It also was a very famous movie starring Robert Redford and and yeah. uh, and whatever his name was. It's also a, a famous singer from a band called The Police. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, pick your sting. Yeah, pick your sting. Yeah. Also, something happens when you get attacked by a bumblebee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, can you kind of give us some uh, insights to your earliest experiences in the industry? Um, you know, in working as a as an assistant or working, just any experiences that you've sure. had in the industry. Again, when I moved out in 1980, you talk about you use the word assistant. There was no such thing. Assistance of the byproduct of the home studio, of someone being needed to take care of the tech, technology issues that's, that you have to be on top of when writing at the computer and with synths in the computer. Um, so, again, when I moved out here, still it was pencil to paper. So composers didn't have assistants. They had orchestrators. And so if you wanted to work with a composer or get in that circle, the only way you could do it really is by coming, by getting in with the orchestra, his lead orchestrator. So even though I may have wanted to be Jerry Goldsmith's assistant, there was no way I was going to be because the job didn't exist. So what did you do if you were wanted to get into film scoring again and you weren't getting hired as a composer? What were your options? They weren't as varied as, as big as they are today. Again, in terms of the assistant thing, it's been a very good, it's been a great opportunity for young composers who are trying to get their foot in the door. I teach at USC in the film scoring program, and today, you know, uh, about sixty percent of the graduating class will get a job within the first year, and of that sixty percent of the graduating class, ninety nine. 98% of those jobs that they will get is working as an assistant to a composer. So that's the way to get a career started. Again, there was no such thing. You didn't get, I didn't learn how to write film scores by being around Jerry Goldsmith or something like that. I, I remember there was a time when I wished he'd been my dad, you know, but I thank the Lord he wasn't in retrospect. Uh, so you were on your kind of own. Um, you know, you could be a music editor, a copyist. Uh, or an orchestrator, you know, or, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of what you did. And I, I tried to get in on the orchestrating route 
but I was a terrible orchestrator of other people's music. It just wasn't my thing. I could orchestrate my own music, but I couldn't orchestrate other people's music. I did not have that talent. So I had to get in as a writer. And I was just the luckiest guy in the world. I started off doing student shorts when I was at UCLA. And one of the students there got money to make a feature. And so I did my first feature while still a student at UCLA. I did my second and third feature while still a student at UCLA. And then that sort of opened up the door for me working with real, you know, film studios. And, and I faded out of UCLA. I never got my degree. Okay, okay. I suppose it's a, it's a, it's a positive fade out rather than yeah, a, yeah, no, a crash and burn no, fade no, out. No, no, it's, it's a, total, totally. But just, just going back to those, those student projects, um, would you have hired student musicians also? Yes, that's what you did. Yeah, back in those days, of course, since the home studio didn't exist, even if a, stu if a student wanted original music for his show is short. Uh, and some of these were like 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 20 minutes at the most. They had, we, they had to bring in live musicians. That's the way it was done with live musicians. So yes, I would get student musicians to come over to Melnitz Hall, which is where the film department is at UCLA, into this little room. I still remember the room Oh, God, his name was Tony Cummings. Tony was just the best. He ran this room and, and would record sound. That was his primary thing for student movies, but he was also, he would record original music. So I'd go in there and do these student movies. And how did you get musicians? And you'd say, we can pay you a buck an hour, some two bucks an hour, but we'll have free pizza. It'll take two hours and you can have lunch. I suppose they were just looking for credits as well, yeah, right? Yeah, it's experience yeah. for, for... Some of them were. A lot of them, you know, didn't, you know, didn't like that film music thing. They wanted to go into, you know, concert orchestral oh, sure. film. Nice. Yeah. But in those days, the studios had resident orchestras, right? Didn't, didn't Alfred Newman have his, like, at Fox, didn't he have his own orchestra? Or? Yeah, I don't know exactly when that system ended, but certainly by the time I came out here in the 80s, that was, that was over. I don't know when they shut the door on that in the 70s, I guess. I guess 70s. But yes, each studio had their own resident orchestra. They had their own, you know, uh, yeah, a, a fully full-time employed uh, orchestra. And not only, you know, each orchestra had their own sound, right. you know, the kind of sound that, uh, that Alfred Newman got out of the Fox Orchestra. There was that famous, they called, you know, the Newman sound. And, yeah. and it was the way he used strings and the way so many other composers that worked for him used the strings. And, of course, the room itself in which the music was being recorded was being recorded had its unique sound and as well the engineers that would record the music so yes you you, had a, you you if you were a staff player you'd show up on the lot at a certain time and just wait to be assigned a, to a recording session i guess or maybe you you, you might you must have known the night but you, i guess I, I don't know quite frankly did you show up every day to the harpist have to come with his harp or have the harp there every day and wait for the... I don't know how it works. And that was all sight read then on, all on the day. Yeah. So, so talented. Yeah. But, so let's let's move forward to uh, your first um, kind of professional after you've moved out of UCLA and you're, you're working as a professional now. Uh, who was your first or your, your kind of... Um, your, your breakthrough score? Was, it, was there one before Hellraiser or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my very first score for the Dorm that Drip Blood was the one that I did when I was at school, and that changed everything. You know, I be, from being someone who dreamed about doing a feature to actually doing a feature, that was remarkable. Before Hellraiser, the probably the biggest movie that I did before Hellraiser was Nightmare on Elm Street Two, right. and that probably was my breakout movie because Freddy Krueger was very big at that time. Now, before that, I'd still done other movies, for sure. I can't even remember the names of all of them. But that was the big one. And I was doing... Uh, I also got the opportunity to do become like the in-house guy at New World Pictures. And Freddy Krueger and the Nightmare movie was for New Line. And that was Bob Shea ran the company. 
And uh, Sarah Risher was, was his assistant. And for New World, it was Tony Randall, was the pit of post-production there. And he was the guy that brought me in to do New World movies. Again, for Roger Corman's company, which was then called New Horizons, it was Clark Henderson. So those were the three companies I sort of gravitated around at the beginning. Uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street movie was the one, the, the prestigious one. The number Nightmare One was a hit. And then I get called to do two, which was great. And then I get called to do Hellraiser. You know, I'd done other things for New World Pictures, smaller movies. Defcon 4, High Point, uh, Avenging Angel, you know, student by day, hooker by night, you know. So who who, do, who, who was the director on, uh, on Elm Street? Uh, Jack Shoulder was the director for Nightmare 2. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your kind of experience working with him, you know, or working in direct with directors in general? Uh, you know, obviously they're never the same. Uh, you know, it changes from director to director. Jack, I can't remember specifics on. What I can remember on working on Nightmare 2 was that the mistake I think that they made in the Nightmare series is that they kept changing the composer. Right. You know, they always were changing. That's, you know, they did not change the composer on the Friday the 13th movies. That was Harry Manfredini. And he laid a specific yeah. musical imprint that sustained its way through the entire series. Of course, the Halloween movies, we had John Carpenter and then Alan Howarth, his, his assistant partner. And there was a consistency there. With the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, they changed the composer in every single movie. When I came on board, the specific instructions were, whatever you do, don't do the score that we got on the first one that was done by Charles Bernstein. I thought the score was great. It was pioneer, a pioneering score of sorts because it was a synth home studio thing and before that became hip. And uh, so it was sort of novel in that, in, in that it was of that sonority. I'm bought on and told that uh, don't do anything like Charles Bernstein. We kind of felt like we got ripped off or whatever and do an orchestra thing. So I remember about that. I mean, one of the things I remember about that score, being very nervous, they wanted, you know, they, they hired me because they heard I would bring in a big orchestra for no money. And I, they said, how many can you get in? I made a, I promised a certain number, I think, of musicians. And I remember when the owner of the company, Bob Shea, came into the recording session, he came into the, into the, the console room, he looked through the, the dividing glass, and he start, I could see him counting the musicians. Really? Yeah, right. yeah, I remember that. We crammed, I think it was 37. Why that number 37 comes to my head, I don't know. I'm not sure that's what it was. It's just a number that's popping in my head. But that was recorded at Mad Hatter, which was Chick Corea, the jazz musician's yeah. studio. And I remember them telling me, for years after that recording. So they'd never gotten as many musicians in that room. And prior to that, and never did they ever t attempt again. And this, this, the whole synth thing, this is before Vangelis did, uh, like, Blade Runner, or he had done... Yeah, I think... Uh, when, is Blade, when did Blade Runner come out? I think late 80s, I think. Okay, yeah, this is the early 80s. Early 80s, yeah. So it was kind of... The transition was in progress then? Just starting to happen. And I think Charles Bernstein was probably one of the first guys to have a home right. synth studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't have one. No one had one. Not, some composers had had invested money in the Sink Levere and the Fairlight, but they cost like... They were like a quarter of a million dollars or something like that. It was like really back in the early days of of the home synth scene now it's as you know every that's yeah. that's everybody does it yeah, you've witnessed the entire several revolutions within the with you like the death of the studio orchestra yeah. the rise of the electronic score and then and the rise of the sampling period uh, the whole thing with how the home recording setup composing at the computer with synths completely changed 
everything. Well, that that was was it mid nineties? Was it? Yeah, the... I, well, I think it was early, even earlier than that. Oh, yeah. Maybe maybe may yeah, it was starting to take over yeah. in the eighties, and then became by the mid nineties was just a done deal. Right, right. It was sort of. You know, Hans wasn't the first person to do it. Of course, you mentioned Vangelis and and uh, 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 what's the name? A, a Tangerine Dream. Yeah, they were there, and 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 I, I remember. Uh, wasn't the first score that got an Academy Award that was electronic was uh, by um, Giorgio Moroder, oh, yeah, yeah. and it was for. Uh, um, I can't even remember. Jan Hammer was doing synth stuff. But, you know, it just, it, it sort of became more present uh, over time. And, and Hans was really critical in, 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 you know, really turning that into an art. He went to the LSO, right? And it was, yeah, sure. he, he was the kind of like that sort of like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it yeah. correctly. You and know? and he, he just, the technology, the, the you know the, the production mm-hmm. value of what he was doing went up noticeably, and and it just changed everything. Right. It changed everything. You know, uh, home scores became something that could be offered to a to a producer or director for, for I mean, really no money. Right. Right. You could get a score yeah. for no money. I think I think uh, you know in terms of the days of playing your themes or your progressions to the director at the piano, you know, they, they died then as well, right? They died then. Yes. When I started, you had to play your stuff for the director at the piano. Um, I think you had a real terrifying experience with that, right? Uh, well, I'm a terrible pianist, and that always was frightening. Wasn't there, wasn't there a director, I can't remember the director's name, but didn't he ask you to play the theme? You hadn't even written a theme yet? And he asked you to play a theme for him. Oh no! I think you're you're confused. There was a story with Harvey Weinstein <laughs> at at, <laughs> at 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 um, very, Miramax. Very I'd topical. Al- I'd already yeah, very topical. I'd already written the score for a film called Rounders with Matt right. Damon. Matt Damon, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I went to the premiere, and he was not happy with the score. Apparently, yes, he wasn't. So. He, he came, I had a meeting with him the following day here in this office, not in this room, in the next room, with that same piano was still there. And, um, and he said, I, we need the music to be much more, you know, passionate and romantic and, 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 the, and, and the less cold or what, I don't know what his word was. The irony there is incredible. <laughs> and so I had to write a theme for the two, for Matt Damon and... Uh, Gretchen Moore, I think was the name of the actress, right on the spot with him sitting there. And he loved it and sent, you know, walked out with a smile on his face. Right. And you just improvise something. I improvise something on the spot. <laughs> That's incredible. Those days are dead, though, those, right? Those pretty much are dead. You know, you know, yeah. I, I, well, coming up with stuff on the spot is not dead, but sitting at the piano and demonstrating an idea spontaneously or doing show and tells at the piano and working with the director and making changes and showing them options at the piano, those days are dead. Right. And, and what it required, of course, was that the director have an imagination. You would say to him, okay, I'm playing this, but this is going to be played by an orchestra of strings, uh, eight timpani and 27 tubas or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, and the director go what? And I go, yeah, that's the sound. He goes, tell me about it. And then I, you know, as I was playing it, and I make mistakes, I'm going, here come the tubas, and I sing the line in sounding like a tuba. And he go, hmm, yeah, tubas. How many did you say? I said twenty seven. He goes, great idea. (laughs) Right. So obviously, directors are, you know, kind of. They're not musicians right. nine times out of ten, right? You know, you might get one director that is semi-literate or semi-kind of familiar with, right. with... So most of the time, do you think that they were just kind of nodding along and saying, I hope this goes well? Or do you think that they were genuinely... I think they genuinely had to... They had to put their heads to work. They had to trust that you knew what you were doing. Right. 
and you had to make believe that you knew what you were doing. And if you didn't, because they, it's all, it's all ethereal. It was like, what is it? What is it you're talking about? An orchestra? I'm trying to imagine what it sounds like in my head. They had, they had to work at it. So one of the best compliments I would ever get is when I go to a recording session and I was here in the orchestra for the first time, let alone the director. It was all in my head. If it didn't work, I was screwed. I didn't have mock-ups to help make me relieve my insecurities. You know, I turned to a director and go, is this anything like you thought it was going to sound like? And the best compliment I could get was, this is exactly what I thought it was going to sound like. Right. You know, so I must have sold, sold it to them. Right. And you, you, when you, when you're in the sessions, you prefer to stay in the booth, right? You don't. Yeah, I don't conduct. I was always a lousy conductor. So I would stay in the booth. Um, and also, I was a lousy conductor, uh, but because I do these package things, I was always worrying about so many different things. And then I never could focus on, on the note, the bar at hand. Yeah. And it helped me to hear when I was doing the student films, because there was no money or very little money, I could hear what was happening and I'd be able to make changes spontaneously. And, um, as opposed to running back into the booth to hearing a playback. Play, playback, yes. Yeah, you're saving time there as well, yeah, right? Yeah, saving time. You're saving yeah. time. So nowadays, though, directors want to hear essentially the very same thing that they will hear on the stand, right? Yes, they want to hear it as close to the real deal as possible. And that's your mission, to make it sound so good that, you know, that the director is so comfortable with their hearing that in as it's been in the case, I'm thinking twice, the directors have decided they don't even need to be at the recording session because they're too busy dealing with a movie they know what the score is going to sound like. They're going to send someone in their place. But they've heard the mock-ups, and they signed off on the mock-ups, and they know this is probably what it's going to sound like. Right. So you, mock-ups are essentially, uh, if you get the okay from that, then you're home and dry, essentially. You've got to Basically, the finish line, yeah. Yeah. If you get the okay on the mock-up, you know, that means they they're, they're, you've cleared their mind of... of any vagueness and low low budget movies or independent productions now are relying essentially on mockups to mimic their budget, right? You know, so for example, for example, you know, if you have kind of again a TV show that's in its first season that they're not really funding, or you know, they'll say, you know, we'll give you four violins, for example. And you just dub it in or overlay it on top of your mock-up and give it realism there, you know. But most most small budget productions rely on mock-ups entirely, right? Yeah. Most small budget productions are never, you know, whatever you're doing in the with the with the synths, the computer, whatever, that's it. That's the finished party. And bringing live musicians into do Hey, most composers don't have the time in television to do that. So it's all synth. It's all synth. It's all synth. And, um, you know, I guess there's some TV shows that are still done with live groups. Yes, there are. There always are some. But for the most part, no. Uh, in television, I believe, but I don't work in television, so I, I may be getting this completely wrong. I have the feeling that though the composers would love to bring in live musicians, and some of them do, I mean, mm -hmm. but for the most part, because of the quantity that has to be delivered, there's no time for that. Obviously, you coming from the period that you come from, yeah. is there ever a time that you hear a mock-up and you go, even I'm impressed, even I would be fooled had I not known that this was a mock-up? Or are your, are your ears always kind of saying, this is, it's it's not quite the same thing. Well, you know, so many of the scores that are done now that are synth scores, right. a lot of them are not attempting to sound like real instruments. Yeah. They're sample ambient, you know, the yeah, ambient the sound, score, sound yeah. design things that are drones with right. ambient, you know, sounds on top of them that are not trying to sound like an orchestra. The ones in which the composer is using the synths to try to replace what would have been a real group, yeah, I can always tell. Right. I can always tell. And it's kind of the point where it's become so 
integrated fake orchestras have become so integrated into our the the audience's understanding of acoustic in music yeah. that they go I don't know what's the big deal it sounds like an orchestra to me right for the yeah. average person for the, the average person and for the average director yeah. and 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 certainly producers music department they can save money sounds fine to them right. Right. doesn't sound fine to me but sounds fine to them right so let, let's go back to your your career and your, um, you know, let's let's talk about the around the millennium. So around the Spider Man gig and and working with Sam Raimi, mm -hmm. can you can I discuss a little bit about coming on uh, the Spider Man projects and working how? Well, you know, I got I got involved in that because uh, uh, I'd worked with Sam before on The Gift. That was the first movie that he directed that I scored. And his regular, his main guy was the one, the very brilliant and talent, you know, talented, brilliant, whatever, uh, film composer Danny Elfman, and they had had a falling out. Oh no, no! In the gift, he just Danny wasn't available. In the Spider-Man movies, he was did the first one. He was on the second one, and there were problems, and I was called in to replace some of Danny's stuff. And so, and then they had a falling out, and so I was called in to do three. Right. And uh, but the un the the thing that was that was part of the package when I came on board was that I was to use his themes. Right. You know, he was going to write not only not only did I have to use the themes from the earlier movies. But any new character, he was going to be writing a theme for. So I was just basically adapting them. Was I okay with that? And I said, Sam, aye, aye, Captain. And, uh, but then Sam decided to go with my new themes for the, uh, for like the dark-suited, black-suited Spider-Man. Right. Yeah, back. it's a wonderful theme. Oh, thank you. And then, then, and then the Sandman Sandman, good Sandman theme, bad Sandman theme, and then the Venom sound, mm -hmm. and so he ended up allowing me to write it, and and uh, so I was thrilled to be able to have that opportunity. I did write new material for Aunt, uh, uh, what, what's her name again? The Aunt, the the this Aunt May. Aunt May, thank you. I came up with a new theme for Aunt May. I actually came up with a theme for their. For their falling in love, right, you know, right. uh, for Peter and um, Mary, Jane Mary Jane, falling in love, and those at the end, at the very last minute were replaced by Danny's original materials because the studio was a little worried that the audience might think, like, where's the old the old right, stuff. Right. But interestingly, the, the DVD apparently there was a DVD that just came out. That has the original score, the score that I wrote, okay. just as I wrote. And how many minutes of music do you, would you say that you wrote for that that movie? How many did I write for that movie? I'm going to guess off the top. Here's another number that just popped into my head. Why? I'd say 83. 80, yeah, yeah. 83, about something like that. Maybe 87. I, I right. may, and now, and maybe now. 70, seven, between 70 and 90. Right. I know you've obviously adapted those. Those into sweets yourself. Yeah, I've been, that's one of my my big obsessions now is revisiting my old scores and trying to find another way to to uh, offer them uh, away from the movie and away from the CD that came out at the time of the movie. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm either turning them into sweets. I guess you define sweets by a series of short pieces that represent the score. Or maybe a tone tone poem. That's what most tone poems are. What extended pieces? Right. I've done an extended uh, uh, Spider-Man tone poem suite, whatever you want. You know, it's interesting to think that at this you find out who he was when you discovered Herman. It was through a series of suites, and now you yourself are making your own suites. That's an interesting point, and I do believe. How old was Herman when he died? Uh, he 64. Yeah, he must have been in his 60s, right? He yeah, just he finished uh, Raging Bull, wasn't it? No, 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 no. He didn't do Raging Bull. He just finished. Oh, God. What am I? Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver. It was a, it was a De Niro movie. He was pretty young. 
he was 64, I think it was. I, I can't remember. Right, right. Yeah, I've I've heard the Spider Man Suite live as well, and it's, it's oh, you heard this? You you what you heard? I think you heard was a series of short cues. Right. No, what I've done now is I've taken them and I've put them, combined them, right. made connective things and turned it into those transitions and transitions, and now it's an I think it's an eighteen minute okay wow continuous piece of music nice. Okay, I look. Continuous. And are you planning to have it recorded, or are you just adapting? No, what I've done is I have audio representations of of using from the original scores, plus whatever I've had to create right. to tie it to glue it together. Okay. Okay. So there's an audio representation of it. There's no score. Right. That's what I've been doing. I've been taking the pre the the already existing recordings and trying to use them and coming up with synth orchestra stuffs right. to act as the glue, right. adding new parts. Mm -hmm. Right now we're working on the violin part for Drag Me to Hell. That's right. going to be an orchestra tone yeah. poem. So coming on to Drag Me to Hell, you continue to work with Sam? Yeah, yeah, I still love Sam. I would, I would do anything for Sam. Anything for Sam. Because the Drag Me to Hell, you're you're returning back to your Penderecki and your and your Ligeti scores, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. And um, but it's so effective; it works so well in the um, the scene, you know, where there, the exorcism occurs and the exorcism is the Emily, Emily Rose, right? Oh yes, that's that's a different one. Yeah, yeah, that's a different movie. But you know, even the, the Drag Me to Hell score was you included the Gypsy. Yeah, that's right. Gypsy violin. The gypsy violin and that violin for the devil, yeah. Simply in that one was was uh, it was it was the combination of the presence of the gypsies in the movie, Mrs. Ganoush, the evil witch, who puts the curse on the lead actress. Um, you know, gypsy music, Hungarian violin, combined with the violin being historically the instrument connected with the devil. It seemed like it was the perfect instrument to yeah, yeah. capture the, the what was needed for the picture. And so, yeah, I immediately tuned into the using the violin. Sam went for it. I said, Sam, let's do something crazy with the violin for the devil. Let's have it played in such a way that no human being could play it. Right. A couple of moments, not not often, right. but, but there's moments in which the, the violin gets pretty insane. Okay, so we're just running out of time. So... Uh, what can we expect from you in the in the next year or two? Obviously, the sweets will come out. Yeah, the sweets uh, will come out. You know, I'm working on a musical. There's a movie which looks like I'm going to be doing. We're just kind of rocking it up as we speak. It's a, a thriller, a great thriller called The Empty Man. The Empty Man. And we'll see how that goes. Um, so... Uh, and, you know, I I don't know what, what my 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 future in film scoring has slowed. You know, my I'm definitely things have slowed down. Why have they slowed down? I would say probably for a couple of reasons. Well, three reasons pop into my head immediately. One, I'm not a kid anymore. You know, and let's face it, Hollywood has always been and will always be run by youthful people primarily. Young directors come in, they want to work with someone their own age, you know. I get it. You know, when I moved to Hollywood, I was probably taking jobs away from David Raxon, who was my teacher, who was, like, you know, much older than I was. So that's number one. Number two is none of the directors that I work with, excluding Sam, really, have managed to continue to have a career. And that's really what it takes. You have to have that one or two directors like John has, you know, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, they will continue to be, you know, like gods in, in the world of directing and will continue to use him. So he's always guaranteed a career. You know, we got Danny Elfman and Tim Burton and, you know, uh, 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 Robert Zemeckis and Alan Silvestri. Right, Just right. there's so many of these bonds and, and, and these directors are still working. As long as they're still working, they'll use, they'll bring the composer for, I don't have anyone like that outside really of Sam. Most of the directors I've worked with are struggling themselves. Right. You mean, you know my music. It's not, it's, it, I, I'm always for trying to update my language. 
but it's not sort of in that home studio synth kind of thing that's very relevant now. And I'm not, I'm just saying, you know, uh, I, you know, that's so, imp that's such a part of what the aesthetic of film scoring is all about that, that, you know, I kind of, I'm in, in that old school wishing to get it into that, but I'm just not being given many chances to do that. Finally, you've returned to social media, right? You've joined Facebook. Yeah, I'm just, try, I'm just starting to do that now. Right, so people can look out for you there on, on yeah, Facebook. I guess, yeah, I guess, yes, I'm just getting into that. Okay, so I will post the uh, relevant links and things. Oh, that'd be great. To, uh, under, under the, uh, where this is embedded, this podcast is embedded, and, and if you want to check out what Christopher's doing and follow his his um, progress on his suites or, you know, contact him and, and you can you can find it there, okay? Well, again, you know, my big thing is we met in Varna, not, not in Dublin. And, you know, one of my favorite things to do is to encourage young composers like yourself who are thinking about getting into film music but are terrified for one reason or another to try to pull that, get that terror yeah. out of their heads. Uh, you know, I'm big, I'm pro Los Angeles, you yes. know. I'm not saying you can't have a wonderful career in whatever city or town you're from, in whatever country you come from. But, you know, being an American-born guy, uh, I was seduced by American movies and knew I had yeah. to come out here. So the reason I'm mentioning this is that, you know, if there's any way I can help uh, get you closer to making the trip out here. Also, uh, there might, there'll be links to Christopher's um, programs that he that he teaches on. And if anyone wants to learn more from Chris, um, you can find information on, on the relevant links. You know, he teaches in Madrid, right? He teaches, Madrid. he teaches in Madrid. He teaches in Varna. At Madrid, Varna, and yes. Dublin yeah. at USC. Yeah. And occasionally elsewhere, right, like you do uh, some online work as well, right? You do some that's work. right. So there's uh, there's an abundance of uh, knowledge to be learned, and it's available uh, in all different forms. Uh, so uh, just to finish up, Chris, uh, thank you very much for taking the time, you and bet. Um, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Bravo, Connor. Cheers. Bye.